Hey, Brazvax here. Finally wrapping this one up. 300 blackout for prepared citizen. Do FRHs ever work? I put water in mine. It sat there for over 20 minutes being cold and I finally gave up and go the uh, the MRE and then it got nuclear hot. Just me. Anyways, the usual disclaimers right out of the get-go. I'm basically a nobody that lacks the self-control to not post this shit on the internet. But on the other hand, you guys keep watching it, so you're, you're partially to blame for this. So this is just really game theory, for the lack of a better term. But I also think if you're serious about preparedness plans and preparing, it's good to think things out. It helps you have structure for your preparedness, your purchasing, your training, you name it, versus just doing Mozambiques at five yards and hoping that's gonna get you through whatever might come. So even if we get some of this stuff wrong, it's good to help uh, help frame a lot of stuff for our preparedness plan. I'm gonna be talking about one specific configuration of 300 Blackout today, namely something like this. A lot of people and a lot of times on the internet, uh, we see something that is analogous to the, uh, what I like to call the, the 300 blackout super position, where people are talking about the size of a, you know, a SIG Rattler using subsonic ammo, but attribute the attributes of a 16 inch bolt gun 300 blackout to that system. So very specifically today, we're gonna be talking about a fighting rifle length one, so give or take eight inches to about 12 inches, don't need to be too specific there, but something in the longer configuration, but not in the full length configuration, where the goal is to use it, as the name implies, a fighting rifle or a sentry gun, for the lack of a better term. The PDW concept, uh, so, you know, the shorter 5 inch, 6 inch, or shorter 300 blackout, suppressed or unsuppressed, that's going to be a different video. I'd love to talk about it, but that's not what we're focusing on today. I'm talking about an analog to a 5.56 sort of SBR thing. Sponsor time. 300 blackout might be a good force multiplier, but do you know what for sure is? Fucking night vision. There are a lot of good places to buy night vision. There are also some pretty coin flippy ones. Today we're gonna to be looking at one of the former, our sponsor, Nightline. Nightline has been in the night vision game for quite some time and are looking to finally step into the civilian sphere and prepare citizens for the upcoming storm. And a critical component of that is actually being able to see in the dark. So if you were already on the fence about buying some, consider opening a tab at Nightline, and when you're going to the purchasing form to fill out your information, drop the, hey, Brassfax sent me, and you'll get a whopping 15% off of your night vision order. Having been in the game for a while, Nightline upends a lot of the trends of night vision buying by having a deep stock, so you can get yours pretty fast, and the ability to talk to the seller directly to really figure out what exactly you want tube-wise, removing a lot of the question marks when buying night vision. If you're wondering, the white foss you see in this video and the footage is a Nightline tube. So yeah, link down below, give them a check out. Okay, back to 300 Blackout. We need to first understand the characteristics and benefits of 300 Blackout in a medium sized barrel, about very roughly maybe seven, eight to 12 inches with a suppressor. The terminal ballistics is the first big one we gotta tackle. So often 300 Blackout is viewed as superior to 5.56 in short barrel configurations. 5.56 out of a short barrel is majorly hamstrung at the absolute floor of its performance window, and really only retains its quoted explosive lethality out to just over an inconsistent 100 to 150 yards, assuming you're using quality 5.56 full power loads. If you use 223, that window is even smaller. Within this envelope, our squishy flesh suits, mostly comprised of non-compressible water, essentially exceeds its elastic modulus, tears, rips, and wounds well beyond the immediate wound cavity. But past this point, 5.56 still acts significantly more lethal than a handgun round, but it's lost a lot of its potential lethality. But only because we're at the floor of 5.56 performance and within the optimal range of 300 blackout performance doesn't mean one is inherently better than the other. There's a large mountain of evidence, both from the GWAT and before, which highlights why militaries are moving away from 762 by 39 functioning a nearly identical round in terms of terminal performance to 300 Blackout and FMJ. 5.56 is more lethal, where lethality is critical, up close. And the ranges where 300 Blackout begins to overtake 5.56 out of this barrel profile is in the 150 to 200 yard range, which is really beginning to close in on where 300 Blackout begins to struggle ballistically. That's not to say 762 by 39 and 300 Blackout are not devastatingly lethal. They for sure they are. But in conversation of 300 Blackout, a round inherently designed to replace 5.56, you gotta compare the two. For some, this more consistent terminal performance may be worth the trade-off, especially if you need a fatter bullet for other reasons, like barrier defeat or being a caliber hipster. 
The weakness of 556, however, can be overcome when switching from M855 or M193 to something like Mark 262, better yet, a bonded duty load, which is not only excellent at barrier defeat, but also covers a lot of the shortcomings of inconsistent tumbling or fragmentation of 556 at the low end of the velocity spectrum. Most people can't afford to buy these rounds in meaningful quantities, meaning if you run 556, you're generally gonna get FMJ and you're gonna like it. But that argument goes out the window when we're willing to invest in a whole new weapon like 300 Blackout, which itself is hard to get and somewhat expensive. Real quick, 150 grains that you can buy in bulk right now? That's training ammo. Don't use that as a price metric. The round needs to use the 110 to 120 grain bullets to really shine, and these are quite hard to come by. Though, PSA's AAC line seems to be doing its best to make that more available at a reasonable price. Real quick, some other considerations rapid fire style. 300 Blackout just does not really produce any noticeable less flash compared to a similar barreled 5.56 in the 11 to 12 inch range with a suppressor. I've confirmed this with multiple people and rifles. It's functionally the same. They are also similarly loud. You generally also want to use dedicated 300 Blackout mags to prevent confusion during training, but also because Gen 2 P mags and most USGI style mags sort of suck at being reliable with 300 Blackout at full capacity. I tried Lancer mag, so in theory I could, you know, look into the mag, but uh, it works, but Lancers kind of suck, and now that I'm using them, I'm for sure they suck. Yes, I'll do a video. I had an entire five minute section here that I, well, frankly, deleted, where I discuss carry weight, barrier performance, commonality, blah, 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 blah. These are all small upsides, and it's defeated by the wallet argument. The Rainbow Blackout is expensive. 556 five, is almost always half the cost. In practice, 556 five, FMJ compares closely to 300 Blackout Supersonics, slightly different, and the upsides are generally offset by the logistical burden of a new round that cost almost as much as premium duty loads for 556 five, that generally actually perform similarly or in some cases outperform what is functionally an AK with AR-15 controls. Preparedness is much less about your gun and more so about your logistics. Okay, thus far I've unfairly ignored the existence of the subsonic round. Why? because I think it's important to understand for people that have finite funds and an incomplete preparedness plan, having a 300 Blackout being a one-to-one -one analog to a 5.56 rifle without the consideration of subsonics is a terrible ROI. It's good, but it's not good enough to justify the cost. When you throw in subsonics, all aspects, instead of just being the primary argumentation for or against 300 Blackouts, just become trade-offs in a sideshow to the main attraction being able to use subsonic and supersonic ammo in the same platform. Okay, let's discuss subsonic 3 and a blackout in isolation real quick. Uh, what, what the fuck are we getting? First off, I don't have a sound meter, so my subjective opinion is one step above making stuff up, so take this with a grain of MSG salt. On a flat range light -like condition, the Rainbow Blackout subs are not going to be Hollywood quiet. You're not going full Metal Gear Solid mode and killing guards off when they look slightly in other directions and then picking them off one by one. If Muzzle Report doesn't give it away, the bullet whizzing through the air certainly will. The Rainbow Blackout suppressed subs are right at the threshold where it's obviously a gunshot if you can hear it unrestructed, but as soon as you degrade that with a combination of structures, trees, distance, especially if the shooter is outside and the listener is inside, or vice versa, sound degrades exponentially. And you're gonna go from something that has an auditory report of roughly 200 yards to something that is very difficult to hear at 25 to 50 yards and unrecognizable, or in some cases completely quiet, past that. Stop moving. Okay, ready when you are. Ooh, and it's gone. You can actually struggle with that too. Mm. It's gone. 
that could just be a bump. That may be a lot to absorb. You may want to go back and rewatch. Well, re-listen. I really want to point out at this point, those early shots, absolutely, yeah, they peak the microphone. To the shooter and about 20 yards and in, regardless, it was fairly loud, but sound has this interesting way of just completely falling off a cliff as distance or obstacles increase. Later shots were 100% representative of what it sounded like on location, and a lot of those shots were quieter than me just going right now. Quieter than that. Muzzled 90 degrees away, outdoors with obstacles, you're beginning to get Sam Fisher quiet, with most shots being at a whisper level, give or take. At 50 yards, pointed at the microphone, but in a structure, Subsonic is going to get drowned out by a sniffle. Actually, in fact, it did get drowned out by a sniffle. And you will, without question, miss that shot. You won't hear it if you are moving, talking, or just not even specifically paying attention to the shot. 50 yards and 90 degrees offset away from the microphone, you're going to potentially even miss it, even if you're paying attention. 75 degrees, both at or away from the mic, you're going to miss it. It doesn't matter even if you are expecting to hear the shot. Personally, I missed the first one and then I looked and realized, oh shit, he's on the second shot and I barely heard it, even when I knew exactly when to pay attention. The funny thing is we were borderline trying to hold our breath because breathing improperly, for the lack of a better term, actually drowned out the shots at about 50 yards and beyond. That's how good it was. That is, well, quite frankly, impressive capability. But what do we get out of it? What do we do with it? Here we can see him. No! Fumbling in the dirt. Some of the use cases are fairly straightforward. The name Sentry Gun gives away its largest real world case. Anecdotes of 300 Blackout being used in GWATs and raids are quite prevalent. It was essentially used to shoot sentries and many times man, but more often than not dogs, which eh, rest in peace little pooch. It allows for far more distance to be closed before the raiding party is compromised. So once again, while not silent, the combination of structured, varied alertness level and speed meant that it functionally was, or at least quiet and indistinct enough that it reduced and eliminated op 4 response time. Then, if the raid and the following exfil went sideways and the unit would be engaged in a firefight, the dude with the subsonic 300 blackout rifle would drop the mag, put in a supersonic mag, and go to work. Something previously not possible with something like an MP5 SD, which is like one step above an airsoft gun at 50 yards and beyond. Now, this use case is probably a bit extreme for civilians in the most fallout post-apocalyptic wasteland, but hypothetically, if you did do something like this, well, there you go. Here's the blueprint. Congrats. I think the use case of 300 Blackout in this fashion absolutely still exists, but generally in a far less offensive manner. For example, we've noticed a recent tendency for flare-ups of localized civil unrest. And occasionally these boil over into large groups moving into residential areas and then just kind of milling around with their hands in their pockets, screaming obscenities, and then they move on generally after scuffing up the neighborhood. At the moment, these haven't been horrifically bad, but it would not take too much more to see a future where one of these groups dial the intensity all the way to the number of your choice above 10. Where these violent individuals aren't just, you know, incredibly annoyed and frustrated, but seriously pissed off. Maybe even to the point where they want blood, with small groups smashing out windows and making entries into homes. You have every right to defend yourself here in this scenario. However, you are pre presented with a tough no-win scenario. Defending yourself and your home will be loud real loud. And the tendency of dealing with this one threat could very easily escalate into multiple threats as others in the area converge onto your location as we have so often seen in recent times, right or wrong. Gunshots for the motivated group have shown to be more of a dinner bell than a show of force. And they will, with some degree of likelihood, absolutely assume you were in the wrong and collapse on your position. It doesn't matter how fast your Mozambique is when you have 20 to 50 no shoots with a couple shoots interspersed. Not a situation anyone wants to be in. Generally, going Rambo mode here is not a good idea for your longevity both in the moment and in the court system afterwards. The ability to use a weapon that instead of a 300 yard signature radius goes to 50, or maybe if they're in the structure, even 20 yard signature radius, does a lot in preventing that aforementioned no-win scenario. The logic of minimizing your shot signature can be taken and scaled quite heavily. The beginnings of collapse of society or even partial loss of rule of law present situation where you really don't want to let everyone know, hey, yo, you guys, I just shot someone. The ability to have the option to stay quiet is really useful to have. A PCC like this TP9 with a chungus of a can 
works very similarly and actually better. But when we go into scenarios where you actually need a rifle, specifically on the extreme ends of collapse, you're basically forced into a two-gun system, or you can use 300 Blackout. For my specific shit hit the fan plan, I plan to chill and utilize my preps to avoid the fight and generally avoid being ventilated. But static defense of a home in a semi-rural or urban area where most of you statistically are is very much a losing battle. And fighting any semi-organized group at your doorstep is a great way to get sieged and checkmated, especially since most homes are terrible fighting positions. As such, I believe periodically sending out recon patrols isn't a terrible idea, even if it's just extending your defensive posture to well beyond the immediate threshold of your house or group of houses or even community. The desire for forward deployed recompositions to avoid the fight at home or even simply get an understanding of other actors in the area, neutral, hostile, even maybe potentially friendly, is extremely useful regardless of if you represent an armed section of the community or just a group of friends that banded together. The short-term risk here is very well paid out in long-term increased odds. And while many times you can accomplish this task while remaining in a neutral or low-intensity zone, just as often you're going to need to move into the unknown, higher risk or even contested area to achieve this task. Now, to be sure, I'm not saying you're sending yourself or others into a literal war zone with a 50-50 chance of contact. That is generally a great way to attrition yourself and your team into non-existence in short order. But even something like a 1 in 10 or even a 1 in 20 chance of bumping into an unknown should be very, viewed as fairly hot because on a long term, 5%, 1 in 20, looks a lot like an eventuality of having a losing fight. But sometimes this risk is needed, as I mentioned. I'll discuss the premise of this in a later date. Having a weapon on the team that can deal with problems somewhat efficiently but quietly enough that you're not just entirely compromised as soon as you use a rifle does a lot for team survivability in the context where just win the fight, bro, isn't actually practical. Once again, this isn't necessarily chasing Sam Fisher silent gun capabilities. More so, it's giving us the ability to use a weapon that maybe not in the immediate area, but in the larger area as a whole prevents the hey, we just discharged a very loud weapon, go pay attention to this area scenario. Even if it doesn't prevent your detection entirely, it makes locating and pinning your team down a significantly tougher task, allowing for a much cleaner break of contact. And because unlike a PCC, which mimics a lot of the subsonic performance, we have the ability to switch to rifle performance. That teammate that's using that rifle isn't borderline dead weight if things go seriously south. That utility could mean having your point man equipped with a sub and supersonic 300 blackout. And he won't instantly fuck up your entire operational integrity when he blasts the bobcat in the face that happens to be sleeping in a room you were intending to occupy. In this dynamic, 300 blackout systems feel right at home. We are looking to avoid the fight, but there are some scenarios where a rifle has to be used, and the ability to have both a competent fighting rifle that can reasonably engage without alerting the entire locale, hey buddy, you seriously fucked up your route planning, is good to have. Uh, hello. I'm horny. Hi, Brass Fake here, and welcome to my crib. We right, have a let's check out my dope rides. <laughs> Dude, I feel like a fuck. I, I have like this. Yeah. <laughs> Brock can't manage his down lead. What a sh. This was a very small section of the potential U cases of 300 blackouts as a subsonic, supersonic fighting rifle. The ability of the system cannot be understated. But so too, I cannot understate this. 300 Blackout is brutal to get into. Only chase this niche capability if you have the funds, the time to learn the system. You don't need an incredible amount of rounds in reserve. Once you figure it out, the holds and so on and so forth, you can generally relegate a 300 Blackout upper into the closet as the manual of arms and the recoil is close enough to 556 that you won't be a useless sack of shit when you pick this thing up for the first time in two years. Just be ready to pay about 60 cents to a dollar a round and more for quality subsonic rounds. You also need to pay, you know, obviously a thousand plus bucks for the rifle, preferably with an adjustable gas of some sort, and then obviously an optics package with it. Combined together, this is not an insignificant investment for a semi-niche use case. But if you can't afford it or you really sold by the idea, I think the value is absolutely there, especially when you fold night vision into the context. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this little POU adventure, and perhaps now you understand why I like 300 Blackout in this larger form factor compared to something like a PDW, and I think it really augments my preparedness plan quite well. 
Well, hopefully uh, you enjoyed that video. Time for the usual YouTube bullshit. Stick around. So if you want to support the longevity of the channel, you can feed me money via this wonderful device called Subscribestar. You give me money, I give you videos. That's how the deal works. It helps keep the channel going, especially in these tough times where everything costs a bajillion dollars and everyone is out to get us. But, you know, leaving a comment down below is pretty cool too. It gives me something to read in the morning while I make my coffee. I appreciate that too. And that's more or less it. We'll see you guys in the next one. I kind of knew this might happen. People have talked about how these don't really hold up. She likes to reposition every time you try to get a good shot.